Next, we have uh, Nick White, CEO of uh, Celestia. Uh, the topic is modular blockchain, past, present, and future. So let's welcome uh, Nick. Hello, hello. Hey, everybody. Um, so the title of my talk today is, oh wait, Modular Blockchains Past, Present, and Future. I am purposely keeping this talk kind of high level because what I want to do is speed run sort of the, the history of how we got to modular blockchains, the problems that they solve, um, and also what are the new problems that still need to be solved to build out the future of uh, modular blockchain infrastructure. So hopefully I can get through in time where we can still have questions if any of you guys have more deep technical questions about modular blockchains. Um, so first a bit about me, I'm the CEO of Celestia Labs and uh, we're building Celestia, which is the first modular blockchain network. And it's a uh, layer one that just does consensus and data availability, so there's no execution. And uh, consensus and data availability, we'll talk about later, are sort of the foundation of the modular stack. Um, and uh, also, I was a, used to be a Stanford student, so it's really cool to be back here. I did some like intro CS courses uh, in, this, in this room. So, um, so the first chapter is uh, monolithic to modular. So basically, how do we go from the origin of blockchains up to the modular blockchain architecture? So uh, like a lot of things in crypto, uh, it starts in 2008 when Satoshi Nakamoto published the Bitcoin white paper. And the real breakthrough um, of this white paper was that it showed there's a way to have people uh, cooperate and transact um, based on using like cryptography rather than using sort of a centralized uh, sort of trusted intermediary. And this is really important because all of our like legacy cooperation systems, whether they're governments or banks or corporations, uh, you name it, they all kind of rely uh, on this, this model where you have a set of rules that everyone agrees to follow. Uh, and then you have to empower a group of, of rulers or, or people who to enforce those rules um, that everyone is meant to follow. And so you create this kind of like power hierarchy um, in, in the system. And the problem with this is that is summed up by this question, who watches the watchman? And what this is getting at is the fact that when you have someone who's empowered to enforce the rules, there's no one to actually enforce the rules on those people. And so you end up with this sort of like security hole that is just baked into our legacy uh, systems of cooperation. And what Satoshi showed is that we could actually have rules without rulers for the first time. And this is, to me, is really the, the unique value proposition of blockchains. And the reason that we can have rules without rulers is that in a blockchain uh, cooperation system, uh, you, don't, you don't need the rulers because the people, the users of the system, enforce the rules directly. And, they, and so now you have this like peer-to-peer, -peer, very egalitarian and equal uh, like system of cooperation that doesn't have this baked-in security uh, and, and trust issue. And the way that users enforce rules is they run nodes. So a user of a blockchain is not just someone who's supposed to send transactions. They're actually supposed to be verifying the things that happen on chain. And they do this by running a node. And a node is just a computer program that knows what the rules of the blockchain are. And it follows everything that happens. And if anyone tries to break the rules, it will catch them. So this is how the, the, the rules of blockchain get enforced by the users. Um, and so anyway, that, that's really the core innovation of, of Bitcoin and blockchains in general. And the issue, though, is that um, in a monolithic architecture, when you're running a node, uh, you have to, if you want to verify every activity that happens on chain, you have to download and verify every single transaction that happens. And what this means is that it's fine when the amount of transactions is, is relatively low because you're, you're able to do that on your laptop or your phone. But as the number of transactions increases, all of a sudden you have to download more data, so you need more bandwidth. You need to verify more transactions, so you're going to need more computing power. And you also might, the, the state of the chain might grow, so you're going to need to have more storage to store that state. So all of a sudden, as the transactions increase, this end user gets overwhelmed, and, and they're no longer able to actually verify what's happening on chain uh, on their laptop or their phone. And so this is a fundamental problem in monolithic blockchains, and it's why most monolithic blockchains have this fixed uh, supply of block space beyond which they, they can't increase. Um, 
And instead, what you have with this fixed block space is that fees increase as the number of users join. And we've seen this play out in uh, several different ecosystems like Ethereum, and it motivates this whole like scaling uh, 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 research. And so you end up in this kind of, uh, I would say, like trade-off between having big blocks, which allows you to have low fees, but then you lose decentralization because less users can verify, or you keep the block size small um, so that you have high decentralization, but then you necessarily uh, have to have high fees, so the, the blockchain becomes less usable for, for average everyday people. Um, and this debate has to, like, popped up all over the place in, throughout like, the history of crypto, and like, a really good example is the, the fork between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, where the Bitcoin Cash community wanted to increase the Bitcoin block size, um, but the Bitcoin co core community wanted to keep it fixed because they wanted to preserve the ability for end users to verify the chain. Um, so that's one of the core constraints in, mon in monolithic blockchains is scalability. Um, but in 2013, Vitalik uh, published the Ethereum white paper in which he uh, dramatically expanded sort of the functionality, uh, the potential functionality of what blockchains could do. So as where, whereas Bitcoin was sort of like a, a calculator, so it can only, it has a sort of limited amount of logic that it sort of embodies, and uh, it's like a, a limited application. Uh, Ethereum generalized blockchains and allowed them to be programmable so that you could actually write new applications um, as smart contracts. And this is a major breakthrough, and it gave us all the applications we love today, like DeFi and NFTs. Um, but there, there's one constraint baked into this, which is that any application that you wanted to write had to run on the Ethereum virtual machine. And the Ethereum virtual machine is very powerful, but fundamentally, uh, you know, it makes certain decisions, design decisions, around what kinds of opcodes it supports, uh, how it prices different uh, activities, uh, like computational activities, and that makes it not suitable for every single application that you might want to build. So like one way to uh, sort of understand this is like, imagine if um, there was one computer and it only ran Windows. Well, we all know as like end users of, of personal computers, like not every application can run on Windows. But like when you're in a monolithic blockchain, you, like you're forced into whatever execution or operating system that blockchain supports. So to sum up, like monolithic blockchains have uh, placed these constraints on scalability and, and flexibility on developers and users. And so that kind of, that brings me to sort of the, the second chapter, which is the, the birth of modularity. So in 2019, Mustafa Abbasam, who is one of the co-founders of Celestia, published uh, the Lazy Ledger white paper. And he, uh, in my opinion, this is another fundamental breakthrough in the architecture of how to design blockchains. And specifically, he uh, proposed a new modular architecture for blockchains. So whereas in a monolithic uh, blockchain protocol, you do all the functions that a blockchain needs to do within one uh, protocol, within one set of nodes, in a modular architecture, you split those functions into discrete, separate uh, layers that focus on those specific functions, and then you can mix and match between those different protocols uh, and layer them on top of each other to build uh, like a modular stack. And um, by doing this, you end up solving those two fundamental problems with monolithic blockchain scalability and flexibility. So I'll explain a bit more about how that works. So specifically in regards to scalability, in a modular blockchain, um, rather than when you want to verify the chain, rather than having to download and verify every single transaction one by one, you just download a tiny sample of the transaction data, and you can verify a single proof that all those transactions are valid. And so uh, this dramatically decreases the amount of work you need to do to verify the chain, and importantly, it means that you can increase the number of transactions without increasing the work it takes to verify it uh, linearly. Um, and so it, it solves scalability in this way. And specifically, I'm talking about data availability sampling and uh, roll-ups. So, uh, you know, Ed was just talking about fraud proofs. Like, that's how you're able to verify a bunch of transactions uh, with a single proof. So, whereas in the monolithic context, if you increase the uh, transaction data, the user basically gets overwhelmed, 
in a modular blockchain, the, you, you can increase the amount of transaction data and the user does not get overwhelmed because of this new technology. Um, and importantly too, uh, one of the features of modular blockchains when it comes to scalability is that the number, as the number of nodes in the network increases, you can support larger and larger blocks. So rather than having this sort of fixed block size where the fees increase as the users join in a modular blockchain, you have this elastic, very abundant block space. And as more users join and run nodes, you can keep growing that, the size of the block such that the fees can remain constant. And then the second thing that modular blockchains provide is, is greater scalability. So because execution is decoupled from the layers below it, um, it gives developers the ability to actually choose what kind of execution environment they want to build within. So, you know, in a monolithic stack, your, the execution is baked in, so that decision is already made. And in a modular stack, the decision is uh, now available for developers and builders to uh, make. So specifically, you can actually run any kind of um, execution environment you want. It could be EVM, it could be the Solana VM, it could be WebAssembly or move, um, the, the, the world is really your oyster as a builder. And so it's in a modular world, rather than just being stuck in Windows, you can have Linux or Mac, or even, I think more interestingly, um, you can have lots of distributions of, of one sort of common uh, VM. So uh, in the same way that in uh, today's operating system world, Linux, there's like many, many, many different distributions of Linux depending on the, the context or the use case. You could have something similar for, for example, the EVM, where you could uh, you know, write custom opcodes in the EVM or modify in certain ways that make it more useful in, a, in the DeFi context or an NFT context. Um, and I think this is kind of the future of where uh, blockchain VMs will go, and this is something that modular blockchains uniquely uh, enable. Um, and so a good metaphor to understand the evolution of these architectures is that if Bitcoin were a calculator and Ethereum were a computer, then Celestia and modular blockchains are like cloud computing. And um, to, to explain that analogy, what I mean is in the Web2 cloud stack, you have a data center which provides this raw uh, sort of compute as a resource, a very scalable raw compute as a resource for Web2 developers to deploy virtual machines to run their applications. Um, in the modular stack, the data center becomes a data network. Like, like Celestia, that provides this raw uh, resource, raw scalable resource of block space on which Web3 developers can deploy their own virtual chains as rollups and run their applications uh, on top of those. So there's a lot of similarities in, in these two architectures. Um, and so now, um, the, the bird that was caged because of the limitations and scalability and flexibility is now free to fly and do whatever it wants. Um, unfortunately, it's not that simple um, because actually, even though modular blockchains solve two very fundamental problems within uh, blockchain architectures, they actually introduce a bunch of other problems that are still sort of in the process of being solved. And so that's what brings me to the last chapter of this talk, which is the frontier of modularity, basically the future of uh, where things are going and like how, how these new problems are being solved. So one of the first problems is um, bridging. So in a uh, monolithic blockchain, you uh, don't have to think about bridging because basically all the applications share one state and they can interoperate atomically with full security. Um, but as soon as you start to break applications into separate uh, islands of state uh, as rollups, then you have to start thinking about, well, how are we gonna let the, these applications that live in, in different islands of state interoperate with each other? Um, and this is a really, really, really big, hard problem, and I'm not actually gonna like, <laughs> there could be many, many different like talks just dedicated to this, but uh, I just wanna highlight um, some of the solutions that I think are really exciting. Um, so specifically, um, I, I'm really a fan of some of the work that this, the team Hyperlane is doing, and to kind of explain how they're solving bridging is that they're, they're building a, like a sort of a, a modular bridging stack, if you will. Um, it's, it's separate than like modular blockchain, it's a, but they're making it so that you can 
sort of modularize the different uh, like interfaces within bridging and uh, actually customize the bridge and, and sort of like um, decide what sort of like security thresholds you want to uh, sort of support. Um, and, and I think that's really exciting. And the other thing that's very important about what they're doing is that it's uh, permissionless, meaning that um, you don't have to go and do business development with some bridge provider to bridge to your rollup. It's actually possible to permissionlessly plug into the sort of the network of, of, of bridges just by deploying a smart contract on your rollup. So this will enable developers when they're building a new rollup um, to quickly have like a bridge out of the box. Um, but another problem is that when you have lots and lots of bridges going everywhere between every different chain, um, it can quickly become this mess, this mess, like really um, complex, lots of like overhead and relayers, and and just um, it can really kind of be overwhelming that the, the amount of like different connections that need to be managed. And um, I think the this kind of brings me to what I think is maybe the end game of bridging in the long term, which is this idea of proof aggregation. So. Um, there are a couple teams like Succinct and Sovereign Labs and probably others who are building for this future where um, chains that can uh, have ZK light clients, so they can have ZK like uh, proofs of their um, state validity, they can actually, you can uh, actually aggregate all those proofs into one sort of like master proof. And rather than having a bridge one to one to each rollup individually, you can have that one single master proof sort of bridge uh, to each and every rollup, like many to many, but with this like simple, very elegant uh, design. And this relates to um, Vitalik's talk at Modular Summit in Paris, where he talked about the future of the proof singularity, where all these proofs get aggregated into, into one master proof. Um, and I think this is probably the most elegant, like long-term solution to bridging but there's a lot of things that need to be solved to get there. The uh, so second problem is user experience. So this is pretty self-explanatory, but when you have lots and lots of different chains, um, it can be really confusing to the user. The user will have balances on lots of different chains at the same time. Um, when they want to interact with an application on a different chain, uh, they'll have to bridge their funds and then do the interaction and maybe bridge back, or maybe they want to do something that actually involves multiple chains. Like, How do you make this legible or, uh, or even like possible for a user to, uh, to interact with. And there's also a lot to be said here, but one of the things I'm really excited about is um, this notion of packet forwarding middleware. And this is um, sort of an addition onto IBC that enables uh, you to create a transaction that gets relayed automatically uh, across multiple hops of different chains. So what would have possibly taken a user um, a long time where they send us one transaction, they wait for it to get confirmed on one chain, then they send the next uh, transaction to go to the, the, the following chain. This enables the user to just sign one transaction and the rest of it gets taken care of. So it really dramatically simplifies the user experience of, of like multi-chain uh, interactions. And so shout out to teams like Skip or Strangelove who are doing a lot of work in IBC. But the end game of interoperability to me is uh, intense. So uh, there's a team uh, in the Cosmos ecosystem called Anoma uh, who have been building um, for a future where rather than having users specify the actual exact, uh, so a declarative um, transaction of like, I want to interact with this contract in this particular way. Rather, the user uh, specifies an intent, meaning they, what they want the end outcome to be, some end state, and then some uh, other actor called a solver can go and actually figure out the best way to make that end state a reality. So what's uh, amazing about this is that all the back end uh, complexity of all these different chains and layers and, and all the stuff happening gets abstracted away from the user and all they know is what they want, and then, that they, and then they get a guarantee that what they want actually took place. Um, and other teams like Flashbots are building Suave, which are also targeting this kind of uh, future of, of interaction. I think like, if we get here, then we can onboard people, and, it, and like, everything becomes very legible and simple from a user experience perspective. 
Another thing is developer experience. So in the modular stack, it becomes more complex because you have so many different modules to choose from. And quickly, it could become kind of like overwhelming for the developer of like, well, you know, I have just too many choices, right? Like, how do I, uh, and also maybe how do I integrate all these different pieces? And I think this is a valid uh, criticism and concern. Um, and the, but there's some really cool uh, uh, people working on solutions. So specifically, I'm going to shout out to uh, Caldera, uh, which is building what, what is called in sort of the modular stack a rollup as a service. So this kind of mimics um, what you see in like the, the cloud, like the traditional Web2 cloud stack, where you can deploy a virtual machine um, that's custom by just like, using a normal like, UI. And uh, that's kind of what Caldera is doing, but for rollups. So the, the rollup developer doesn't actually have to know how these things work. They don't have to manage the infrastructure. They just need to know what they want, the parameters they want, and they can uh, click deploy, and then their rollup is live. And I think this is really an exciting uh, way and, and something that I've visualized from the very beginning of like this is uh, a really desirable like developer experience. And it's how we can actually make deploying a new blockchain as easy as deploying a smart contract. Um, but also, it's important to note that like the modular stack doesn't actually force you to build your own rollup. You can still build a, a smart contract, and I think that's probably the right thing to do for most people who are just building and prototyping and trying something out. Just write a smart contract, you can deploy it on a general purpose rollup like Arbitrum or, or Optimism. Um, and then only when you have a thesis about, okay, this is the kind of customization that I need, is it worth going into the complexity of deploying your own rollup? And the good thing is that modular blockchains actually um, give you that option to go to that level of the stack and have access to that kind of customizability, uh, but you don't have to uh, be exposed to that complexity if you don't want to. Um, another problem is decentralized sequencing. So rollups rely on sequencers, and sequencers, uh, most of them today are centralized, meaning there's one single node that is taking in all the transactions of, of the rollup and performing all the state updates and posting them on chain. And the problem with this is that if that rollup goes down, that node goes down, then you lose liveness, or if that node decides to censor you, there's, there's no like, alternative. So these centralized sequence rollups don't have very good censorship resistance and liveness properties. And so that's why people want to decentralize the sequencer, have multiple sequencers, so you can have more uh, redundancy and you can have better censorship resistance. And um, unfortunately though, if, if we want to decentralize every the sequencer set of every rollup independently, that would mean there's this huge amount of replicated work and deploying a new rollup will kind of be like just deploying a new blockchain, uh, which will be way too much overhead. But fortunately, there's a really exciting uh, new sort of area within the modular stack called shared sequencing, where um, it's possible to have a single uh, sequencer set and have that sequencer set sequence of the transactions of multiple rollups at the same time. So those rollups all of a sudden can share this, this committee or the, like sort of the, the overhead of sequencing, of decentralized sequencing with, with one uh, thing. And um, so as you can see, this is a good diagram to understand how it works. Rather than having users send transactions directly to the rollup uh, like full nodes slash sequencer, um, the, the users would share, send their transactions to the shared sequencer, which would then post those to the data availability layer and then the, the rollup full nodes would read from the data availability layer to uh, construct the new state of the, of the rollup. And so this is one way that a developer can actually plug into and get decentralized sequencing out of the box. Um, and last but not least is MEV. So um, in the monolithic world, the MEV supply chain is uh, more or less well understood. Obviously there's still a lot of research and, and work going on. Um, but what happens in the modular stack is that you, because you have all these different layers, uh, the MEV supply chain gets way more complex. You don't, you're not just dealing with the ETH validator set. You're dealing with the sequencer. You're dealing with maybe the settlement layer. You're dealing with the DA layer. And it becomes much harder to reason about uh, where MEV gets captured. And um, you know, I still think this is like very, very, very much in early stages of research and understanding. But one of the solutions I'm really excited about is being built by a team called Skip, 
in the Cosmos ecosystem who have built something called the Block SDK, which is a, a generalization of this uh, original concept, which is protocol and building. And what the Block SDK does is it gives a developer, a role developer, uh, or app chain developer, fine-grained control over how blocks in their uh, chain can get built. And so this, uh, it breaks, basically breaks a block into different lanes, and you can specify like how those lanes get used, and it even gives you the ability to say like how do we, like what kind of MEV uh, do we want to allow, like is valid in our chain, what kind of MEV do we want to exclude, and also how do, how do we uh, distribute that MEV uh, among the different participants in the network. So I think this is a really exciting thing, and, and one of the, uh, also another reason why like the customizability of rollups and app chains generally is gonna be so powerful. Um, and then, you know, uh, to, to close, I just wanna say that like, obviously there's a lot more teams than the ones I was able to mention, and, and even more, more exciting problems than the ones I was able to mention here, um, and so I wanted to give all these other teams in the modular ecosystem a shout out, and uh, I'm hoping that my, my, my goal with this talk was that some of you in the audience are gonna be, uh, get nerd sniped into uh, thinking about modular blockchains and, and wanting to solve some of these new exciting problems. If you are, come talk to me, um, and I would love to hear what you're thinking about building. And I, even though there are definitely problems in the modular space that need to be solved, I am very confident with the, uh, the talent and quality of the different builders and researchers in, in the modular space that we're gonna solve them and we're gonna be unbothered, moisturized, happy, in our lane, focused and flourishing uh, in a few years time. So thank you very much. Um, I, uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter and uh, I'd love to hear from you, but I also have a few minutes for questions, so if anyone wants to ask something. So the question is about, is it about pricing data availability or is it the fact that there's gonna be multiple, potentially multiple protocols that each have their own fees? Or? Mm. I mean, so that's a very good question. I think that the way that we're planning to price data availability is, is pretty just simple at, at the start. I think it's maybe a little bit early to try to do anything too fancy. Um, and so it basically is, is sort of like a, <coughs> a there's sort of like a base price, and then if there's like in spikes in demand or like some sort of congestion, then the, the price can increase, um, so that that uh, you you can like uh, prioritize the things that are, are higher value essentially. So it's very similar to like the pricing of any other like like Ethereum for example or any other L1. Um, but in terms of like pricing generally, I think that what will happen is that fees will get more and more abstracted away from the users. And um, I think like the users, it, it kind of like will filter, like the fee, the user will pay some like fee at the high level at the user interface, or maybe not even pay a fee, it might be internalized by other uh, layers of the stack. Um, and then that, that fee will eventually like sort of be split between the different protocols uh, at, on the way down. Um, but anyway, I have, any other questions? So the question is, um, doesn't big blocks like lead to the same, in a modular context, lead to the same centralization issues? So uh, the, the, the reason it, it doesn't is that, uh, so what matters, right, is that users can verify the chain at the end of the day. In a monolithic blockchain, that means you have to download and verify every single transaction. So as the block gets big, you, can't, you can no longer do that at some point. In a modular blockchain context, there's two key technologies. One is data availability sampling. It allows you to verify that the data behind the block is available with, by downloading just a very, very small sample. Uh, so now, 
that solves kind of like you can increase the block size now without like causing higher overhead for for users to verify. And then rollups are the other piece of this, where they rather than verifying every single transaction one by one, you just verify either a zk proof or a fraud proof to know that the uh, those transactions are valid. So now the you can increase the number of transactions without increasing the overhead of verifying the chain. Does that make sense? Yeah, we can talk after too, yeah. Um, do wallets work differently in the modular ecosystem? Not really. Um, you, like for end users, you would have a wallet that is an account uh, on the rollup that you're using, essentially. So it will be pretty much the same. Um, and but, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different models, but yeah, for the most part, no. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, come talk to me outside if you have more questions.